Welcome uh, to Impacts of COVID on the Cattle Industry, uh, sponsored by the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association and the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. We have a really good program tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Vic Ford. I am the Associate Director of the Cooperative Extension Service in the Agriculture and Natural Resources Group. And my name is Mike Looper, and I'm the Department Head for Animal Science, and so we have faculty in Fayetteville, Little Rock, and also in Hope. And so tonight, um, we do wanna share with you some information that we hope will help in making decisions as you navigate these uncharted waters with COVID-19. Uh, I know we've all been impacted, but I want to acknowledge those that have personally been impacted in this state. Um, the last number I saw from the governor's press conference is about 349 Arkansans have tested positive. So uh, our, our thoughts and our prayers are with those folks, a speedy recovery. We know there's folks suffering in this state, across the country and around the globe. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we're in uncharted waters. You know, I don't know who said it, but someone said, may you live in interesting times. And, and I think today we live in interesting and, and anxious times. And, and so uh, as we go through and think about the livestock markets, as we think about how we can maybe minimize the impact of COVID-19 in the markets, both the livestock market, the stock market. Uh, Cody Burkham from Cattlemen's called me last week and we were brainstorming on how we could help Arkansas cattle producers. Uh, that's our job with the Division of Agriculture and obviously that's the, the job of the Arkansas Cattlemen's and so we've worked very collaborative with Cody and with the Arkansas Cattlemen's and I want to say thank you Cody for making that phone call and, and tonight uh, this is kind of the uh, the culmination of that phone call. So we're going to have folks talk about the, the economics uh, the projections, the uh, what they see in the future, maybe, so to speak. And again, if you're like me, you've probably read and, and, and consumed about as much information as you possibly can about all this. And so it, it becomes problematic to keep it all straight in my mind. And that's why Cody and I thought it'd be good to get the experts, as Dr. Ford mentioned. And so I want to thank our speakers. Uh, I, I think you're in for a treat and something that's very serious. Uh, but I do think bottom line is that uh, you'll come away with this with some information that will help you make those decisions, at least we hope you do, uh, make those decisions uh, in these in these very difficult times. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Cody again. Uh, we appreciate your time. We know it's serious. Uh, and, and Cody, I appreciate the, the collaborative efforts that the Division of Agriculture, Animal Science, and the Arkansas Academies are doing, not only tonight, but throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Looper. Good evening. My name is Cody Berkman. As Dr. Looper mentioned, I serve as the Executive Vice President of the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association. And thank you for joining us tonight. You know, since 1959, the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association has been the leading voice for Arkansas cattle producers here at the state. Uh, we're proud to partner tonight with the University of Arkansas Division of Ag to bring you this webinar and hope that you'll gather some information that, would, that will help you and your operation go forward. Um, during these tough times, as Dr. Dr. Ford and Dr. Looper have mentioned, we really have a great lineup tonight, and we want to thank them for joining us as well. Um, you know, we want to continue to magnify the voice of the Arkansas cattle industry, both here in the state and on the national level. And we're a grassroots organization, so we serve what our members want, and uh, they pass their policy, and that's what they and that's what we go and fight for. So. We wanna make sure to all the cattle producers out there that if you're not a member, we wanna make sure that we invite you to join and be a member of the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association. We need your membership. We need you to, to be in the spot with us, uh, not only through the tough times of the COVID-19 outbreak and the markets that come along with it, but every other time of the year, uh, whenever things are tough or other, other times of the seasons that, uh, that, are, that are hard for our operations. So if we can do anything for you, please let us know. Uh, we want to help cattle producers however we can. Our uh, office number is 501-224-2114. And we also invite you to join us on social media. We have a Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, also an Instagram. So if you're on social media, please feel free to join us on that or check out our uh, online presence at arbeef.org. So that's all I want to say for tonight. I, right now, I'll pass along to Dr. John Anderson, our first speaker for the night, Dr. Anderson. Thanks, Cody. I'm uh, uh, going to talk to you a little bit about the market tonight. And uh, I would say, you know, after a long time of doing this, I don't think the cattle market is ever boring. Uh, 
but uh, it's it's a it's a little too exciting, I think, for most of our good right now. Uh, it's a very um, fluid situation around COVID-19 and the impacts it's having on the market. So as I go through this and kind of talk about what's happening in the market, keep in mind that uh, that things are changing very rapidly, and uh, the shelf life of anything I tell you tonight probably has uh, is about five minutes, uh, if that. There's certainly, uh, I don't ever give a warranty on my uh, market presentations. I'm sure not giving one on this one tonight. But uh, I do want to give you a little bit of background uh, that I hope will, 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 will at least give us some context for making decisions uh, as we think about uh, COVID-19. And I think that's, uh, that uh, hopefully will be helpful to you. The market has moved really quickly. Now this slide uh, is a day or two old, but uh, I want to show you kind of the magnitude of the impact that this situation has had on the market. And a good way to illustrate that is with the April live cattle futures contract. Uh, April live cattle dropped about 25% in value uh, since mid-January. The bulk of that came uh, really since the middle of February, when it's, which is when I would say this, this, this kind of COVID-19 market really got Got, got going. It's bounced quite a bit. If you look at uh, uh, if you look at where we were today, we're probably going to end up end up somewhere around this dollar five mark. So uh, a big rebound in the last day or two. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. For the most part, through this drop, I think the cattle market, at least the cattle futures market has really just mostly been taking its cues from the financial sector. Uh, this is a chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and you can see that it basically fell off a cliff there about that mid-February time period. And, uh, and it also has rebounded quite a bit. We're looking now at about, the, we, we broke 22,000 today, which is a big milestone to, to get back. I don't know that I've got a lot of confidence in this financial market rally right now. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty out there in the market, but the key point here is that what we've seen in the cattle market for the most part, uh, particularly if you look at cattle futures, has really just been uh, the market moving in lockstep with the broader financial position, the, the broader financial sector. Cash cattle have dropped quite a bit. Uh, again, this mark, this this graph will look different after this week, but uh, a fairly large drop uh, uh, since the beginning of the year. This is not as dramatic as what we've seen in cattle futures, but obviously, uh, going from about a buck twenty, buck twenty five to uh, a buck uh, eight or nine uh, is a big deal in the fed cattle market. It looks like this year we'll. We or this this week we may end up close to 120, probably somewhere between 119 and 120 on fed cattle, which will be a, a fairly significant rebound in this market. Uh, and again, reflecting uh, some some situations related to COVID that we'll get into in just a second. But a lot of volatility, big losses, and now a lot of volatility. Feeder cattle have kind of done the same thing. A, a pretty good pop this week, it looks like. But we have taken a lot of value out of every sector of the cattle market. A lot of what's going on here has mostly been, uh, obviously cash market losses have been real, but the, the bigger drop has been in, the, in, in cattle futures. And again, that's mostly driven by uh, the broader financial market situation. Uh, cash prices have been strong relative to futures prices, which is not saying a whole lot, but what that means is we've ended up with a, a large positive basis in the market uh, because the cash market has been tracking closer to market fundamentals, at least as best we can determine those fundamentals uh, than, than, the, uh, than the futures market has, which really has just kind of been running along with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And so there's good news and bad news in that, in my opinion. The good news is that market fundamentals are almost certainly better uh, than what the futures market has been pricing in. That's not to say that the fundamentals are great. We do have a big challenge in front of us, but uh, market fundamentals are probably better than, you know, kind of the whole world is burning mentality that's been in the financial markets for a couple of weeks now. The bad news there is that market fundamentals really aren't as good as we'd like for them to be and really not as good as we thought they were going to be to start the year. Uh, let's kind of get away from COVID-19 for a second. It's not the only thing going on in the world. Uh, meat production has been quite a bit higher than, uh, than most people anticipated that it would be if you roll back, say, a month or certainly two months ago. 
It looks like now first quarter beef production is going to be up nearly 7%. Uh, first quarter pork and poultry production will both be up around 8%. Those are big increases in meat in, in meat production. So when I say the cash market is, 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 is tracking closer to fundamentals, that's not necessarily a great thing because those, those fundamentals are actually a little bit challenging on the supply side right now. The big, uh, the big issue we have going on with COVID-19 right now is I think we've got a huge disconnect between the short run situation in the market and the long run situation in the market. Now, and let's talk about the short run for a second. Right now, the market is really being whipsawed in a big way. Big drops, and now in the last couple of days, big rebound. What I think is behind that, a couple of things. One, there's massive uncertainty on the part of consumers. I mean, a lot of people don't even know if they've still got a job out there right now. Uh, the unemployment situation is, is unprecedented, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, nobody knows when things will get back to normal in terms of their day-to-day -day life, kids going to school, being able to go to restaurants, getting a paycheck. Uh, that kind of uncertainty is really hard for a market to assimilate, and that accounts for a lot of the up and down we've seen. On a, it's not really a positive thing, but one thing that's driven some of this recent price behavior has been the panic buying that we've seen in grocery stores. Uh, there are stories all over the country about empty meat cases. People are buying anything that's uh, that's meat, uh, as long as it really is meat, and uh, that has created. I think that's really drained the supply chain to some extent. And what we see now, I think, are retailers and packers working very hard. Uh, to to to, re to refill that supply chain after this spate of panic buying, and also probably processors thinking ahead to what's going to happen if we have a supply chain disruption, if we have to shut a plant down because of a COVID outbreak in the plant, or if we just can't get workers to come to the plant, or if uh, if, if we can't get uh, if we can't get uh, H2A workers in place. There are a lot of things that could disrupt a plant. And so I think some of some of what's going on is the packers are trying to make hay while the sun shines in terms of getting meat processed. And that's actually popped the market pretty significantly. This is a wholesale beef, uh, beef price, the box beef cutout value. Big run, this is a daily chart. So this price is day by day in the last seven or eight days, we've had a big run up in, in these wholesale prices. And again, I think this is retailers trying to restock after all the panic buying that's going on, this has now spilled over into cash fed cattle market and, and in turn into our feeder cattle markets. And I think this is the situation that accounts for the pop we've had in prices. This is not necessarily a long run positive situation. In the long run, I think uh, really about all the COVID-19 impacts I can come up with are fairly negative. On the demand side, this is a really important uh, point, I think, to get. Probably the most important thing you'll get out of me tonight is that panic buying is not the same thing as an increase in demand. And it might, uh, it might look like it, it might be easy uh, to convince ourselves that it is, uh, but it's really not. Essentially what panic buying does is, is pulls demand from later periods forward into the current period. And it's created this short run sh uh, shortage that the market's scrambling to cover to maintain continuity in the supply chain. But it's not the same thing as an increase in demand. It doesn't necessarily mean that demand for 2020 is gonna look better than 2019 because we've had this run of strong purchasing. That meets in somebody's freezer somewhere and it's gonna be used. Uh, so uh, panic buying long term may not help us a whole lot, although it has given us a nice little pop in the market now. We clearly have a disruption in the restaurant trade. There's barely a restaurant open anywhere in the country, it seems like. A lot of restaurants are doing takeout and, and, and drive through service. Uh, but the loss of restaurant business is a big deal for the beef industry uh, that pr cuts pretty deep in the beef industry because so much of our product, including so much of our high value product, goes through those food service outlets. We will also see, I think, because of uh, precautionary saving in a time of uncertainty, people want to have more liquidity, they want to have more money, they want to pay that down. People are going to try to save more money, and that may continue for a long time after this event kind of formally wraps up. Uh, that increased saving is going to shift people toward the lower end in a lot of product classes, including meat. That also is a negative factor long term for the beef industry because the beef, the, the beef industry just doesn't have a lot of product offering there at the low end of the scale compared to our competition. May also be some wealth effect at work 
there on people as they've seen these losses in broader markets. Just a lot of factors about this, I think, will cause people to kind of draw in pretty tight uh, in terms of their spending habits. On the supply side, I think we will get some help. The second half of the year looks much better than the first half of the year in terms of expected beef supplies. And as those smaller supplies show up later in the year, I think we're probably pulling some production ahead as well as pulling some demand ahead. So that'll give us more of a break in supply in the latter half of the year. We will get to a more supportive supply situation in the latter half of the year. And if that's coupled with uh, a return to something like normalcy in the markets, we could end up with a pretty good latter half of the year. But we do have a long way to go. I want to show you this related to that, that precautionary saving that people are going to do. And that a big part of the reason I think people are really going to draw back on, on spending, much like they did in the 2008 financial crisis. This is a chart of initial jobless claims. And the, the key part is this last bar over here. We had over 3 million initial jobless claims last week. That is the largest we've ever had on record by a factor of about five. Uh, unprecedented level of, of unemployment. Uh, you know, part of this is that I think some rules have been relaxed that people don't have to wait. You know, there's no waiting period to file an initial jobless claim now. So there may be some policy things out there that have juiced this number a little bit but the jobless claims uh, are, are kind of sobering to look at. And if people stay unemployed, if this unemployment drags out, uh, we will have uh, a real demand side issue to sort through and it'll take a while. Some final thoughts uh, to reiterate a couple of things. One, uncertainty is extremely hard on markets and we're in a period now where we've got great uncertainty. You know, a lot of times when we deal with disaster situations in agricultural markets, we're dealing with a discrete event. It's a, it's a flood, it's a tornado, it's a hurricane that's hit a key production region. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a shock to the market that we can define within a period of time. Uh, this COVID-19 outbreak right now is an open-ended event. And uh, that uncertainty itself is really hard for the market to try to work out. Moving forward, even if the news looks bad, that uncertainty will begin to resolve one way or the other. Uh, and that will, be, that will be helpful. To me, we, we, in a sense, we're in the worst part uh, of this situation now because we're probably dealing with the most uncertainty we will deal with. And uh, as things resolve, that will help. If the COVID-19 outbreak has abated in the next month or so, the rebound in the market could be fairly quick. You know, if we don't have a protracted period of unemployment, I think the underlying fundamentals in the economy were pretty good. We, we started this with the, the healthiest job market we'd had in a long, long time in terms of unemployment numbers. Uh, so uh, assuming that those underlying fundamentals can be recovered fairly quickly, uh, we could have a fairly fast rebound. Again, the supply side of the market will get to be more supportive as we move through the year. Uh, the question is how quickly will this resolve and how much demand destruction is being done uh, as this thing drags out. And I think that's, that's what we'll be sorting through over the next uh, few weeks and, and, and couple of months really. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for, for being on this webinar. I hope you get something that, uh, that will help you. It's a difficult environment to make decisions in. Hopefully some of this will, will help you at least get uh, some clarity and a little context for making those decisions. My name is Jody Allman. I work with Farm Credit Services of Western Arkansas. I've uh, been with Farm Credit for 14 years now started out as a loan officer and I have become a credit analyst. And I look at these credits every day. I look at cattle producers and I look at the, uh, the things that you guys are facing. So um, what I wanted to share this evening are some options that you guys have as cattle producers. Um, like I said, I'm from Farm Credit. Uh, I'm a senior credit analyst. I work out of the Arkadelphia office. Farm Credit, you know, we're a nationwide corporation, a nationwide um, entity uh, with several, with many different associations. Our association is Western Arkansas. We service the 42 counties, the Western 42 counties of the state. Um, there's actually uh, four different farm credits in the state of Arkansas. So I represent uh, Western. Um, we have over 6,000 members. Our loan portfolio is uh, 1.2 billion plus now. Um, as a cooperative, we have patronage refund that we give out and we've done over a million, a hundred million dollars since 1997. And we're uh, knowledgeable in the beef industry. 
Uh, beef comprises almost 20% of our total portfolio, which is our second largest exposure. So we deal a lot with beef producers and beef loans, and we understand the financing of those. Um, when we talk about the fact that we do beef, uh, we deal with, you know, whether you're full-time, you're part-time, you're uh, cow, cow, stock, or feeder, feeder, feedlot cattle, large producers, small producers. I know I uh, looked earlier, I think there's uh, 200 or so that are on this uh, webinar tonight. There's a various amount of different size, different type operations. And uh, we, you know, we've dealt with, with many of those. So what I'm here to talk about is what can a cattle producer do in a down market? Uh, we're in, as uh, John said, we're in uncertain times. Nobody really knows what to do because we've never seen this before. What's going to happen with our um, with our herd, what's going to happen with the markets, how are we going to make the money that we need to uh, continue uh, staying in this uh, industry. And I'm going to talk about three things tonight. First one is extending a payment, an extension, um, a re-amortize of a payment, and then maybe even a rebalance of your loans. So I'll talk about each of these individually. Um, when we talk about extending a payment, so if you extend a payment, uh, that is typically what I would consider a good fix for a short-term problem. Uh, I'll use the example of a cow-calf producer. If you're a cow-calf producer and you have your calf crop, and let's say that we're in this down market like we are right now. Prices are short. Uh, they're not where we think they need to be. And we have the, we just would like to wait it out. You know, maybe, maybe there's some good news in the market and we think in a few weeks or months that it should rebound an extension of a payment extends one payment for a period of 30, 60 or 90 days. Now that would be one of your, you know, a lot of, a lot of cattle loans are on annual payments. Uh, any loan that you have that is made with your calf crop, the, the proceeds from your calf crop would, would be eligible for this. So, you know, another thing would be maybe your calves didn't grow off like you wanted them to, and you need 30, 60 or 90 days to put a little more weight on them this type of an action can help with all of that. Um, an extension of a payment, it's like I said, it extends one payment on one loan and it's typically one time. So the extension is the short term fix, 30, 60, 90 days is what we at Farm Credit try to do. And typically it's a, it's a one time event. Now you may say, well, what if I need longer than that? What if this market looks bad? Or what if, you know, I need to, to have more time than that? Well, the next option for that is a re -amortization. And that's a big old fancy word. We actually call it a re -am, is what we refer to it as. And it, in essence, it helps you, it allows you to make a partial loan payment. So let's say you've got that group of calves that are, um, they're up to the weight, but you've just, you've run out of time and you've got to get them off there. You've got to get them off your place to make room for more. You've got to sell them now and there's not enough money there to make your payment. You have a payment due and you just, the, the mark, it's not there. Well, what the REM will do will allow you to make a partial payment. You can make the partial of that payment and then what's left of it will be put on, a lot of people refer to this as putting it on the back end of the loan. I hear a lot of customers come in and say that. They say, well, can we take the rest of that payment and put it on the back end? And the answer is yes, that's a possibility. So what it does is, you know, just use for, let's use for example, say your annual payment's $30,000 and your calf crop brought you 25,000 and there's 5,000 and you can't, you can't do it. Well, what it would do is it would be, it would add the 5,000 to the remaining principal of that loan, whatever that may be. And say, say it's the first payment in a five year loan. So you have four payments left. It would take that 5,000, re-amortize it, over the remaining four payments. So it just spreads it out over the remaining four payments that you have on your loan. And this allows you a little bit of time. It allows you to regroup, catch back up and get going for that next year. Hopefully markets improve and, and or whatever issue you're facing, you can get through that time. You know, in some instances, maybe it's a bigger loss than 5,000. Uh, certainly we've seen those. We don't like to talk about them, but it's possible. But say it's it's a lot larger than five thousand, and reamortizing it over the remaining term is just not an option. That makes, in that instance where you reamortize re it over the remaining four years, that will make your normal annual payment go up because you're taking that extra five thousand and distributing it above and beyond what you were already paying. 
Well, if that, if the, if the reamortized amount gets your payment higher than what your calf crop will support in a good year, there is the potential to add a year to your loan. So rather than spreading that out over four years, you would then spread it out over five in this example, maybe it's three to four, but a reamortization is probably, it, it works well if you need a year extra. So one year, this is a, this is certainly a tool you can use. And I'll lead into that and say, well, Jody, what if we need more than a year? What if we had a big loss? Um, you know, and when I say a big loss, I think back to, you know, 2015. That's something that as cattle producers and people in the cattle markets, we don't like to talk about that year because of what happened. But, you know, we saw a lot of people that lost quite a bit of money. And this last option that I'm going to talk about tonight is a rebalance. A rebalance, you know, a lot of people call them a refinance or a restructure. Uh, that's all the same thing. Uh, we refer to it as a rebalance uh, at Farm Credit. So this rebalance loan, it can spread debt that you may have trouble making. It can spread that out over a longer term than maybe just the one year that the REAM can do. So this rebalance, you know, just for instance, let's say you get into a, uh, a business deal and, you know, a, a rebalance have seen it a lot more with like maybe feeder cattle and stocker cattle uh, producers where maybe they bought cattle at a, set, at a set price and then when they go to sell them, the market has dropped. So they bought high and sold low, which is opposite of what we want to do. Then there's operating debt. There may be some term debt payments that's left out there that you don't have the funds to pay. In this case, we would take the equity that you have in other assets and we can make you a loan that will pay off that debt, that, that residual debt that you were unable to pay and spread it out over a, a longer term. Maybe it's three years, maybe it's five, maybe it's seven, you know, in some instances, 10. Um, the shorter the term you can make that rebalance loan, the better off you are because you want to get rid of it. But this is something that we can look at, looking at the, um, when we look at the, the value of the asset and the, the quality and the, uh, useful life of that asset can determine how long we can spread that payment over. So a rebalance, you know, you go from an extension to a ream to a rebalance. Rebalance would be worst case scenario. This is, this is something that, you know, we've had some big issues. Extension would be, you know, this is one that uh, we just need a little bit extra time. So those are some things, some things that you can do to help you survive in these times. Um, something else I wanted to discuss with these three actions, you, know, you may be asking, well, what can, what can I do? What can help when I'm facing these issues? How can I help? What can I do? Um, nobody knows your operation like you do. You're the only one that under, you understand it the best. So the, so you need to understand how short are you on the payment? Where are your cattle today? What are they, what do you expect them to bring when you take them to market? And how far behind do you think you're gonna be? Knowing where you are financially helps this greatly. You, I, I recommend to everybody I talk to, fill out your own balance sheet. The balance sheet lists your assets, your liabilities, and tells your equity. That's a big thing for producers to understand. Understand your finances, understand your balance sheet, know where you stand, your earning statements, Understand how much money you made last year. What were your expenses? What was your profit? Understanding your profit really helps you to understand your operation very well. And then also your break evens. This is a this is uh, big for all types of producers. Understand how much do I have to make to break even? And you know, with that, you know, you can look into hedging, you can look into price protection, a lot of different things that go along with that. But if you understand all these things, this is certainly going to help you when you face these issues of these down markets and, and the things like what we're facing today. And the last thing I have there is make a plan. When you go talk to your lender and visit with them about your problems and, and the issues that you're facing, a plan is one of the best things that you can bring to say, this is how I think that we can, that I can make it. This is what I think we can do. Your lender is equipped to listen to that. And maybe he directs you in a direct, he directs you in a path that's better than what you're thinking. It may come out on the better end for you, but understanding your financials is a best way that you can help yourself with these, with these uh, issues. You know, any of these actions, extension, re rebalance, 
they're all options when you're having financial shortfalls. They are all things that are, you know, your lender can do these things. Um, now with the 200 people on here, there are 200 different situations. You know, I'm sure there's a producer out there that says, Hey, I'm hedged. I'm protected. I'm good. This, this down market right now is not affecting me. And there's some that are thinking, what am I going to do? And then there's all in between. Every situation is different. There are customizable ways that we can help your operation. Um, I just recommend that when you're faced with these issues, you contact your lender, visit with them, be open with them, and, um, and let them help you. At Farm Credit, we're here to help. I would love to talk to any of you. Um, we, can, we can look at your stuff. We can help you get a balance sheet uh, established. My name's Tyler Davis, and I'm a market president with Diamond Bank. And, uh, Diamond Bank, we're about a $700 million asset lender uh, in southwest Arkansas. And, and for a bank of our size, we consider ourselves a, an ag-specific an ag bank. And, um, but, um, you know, Cody asked me to, to, I guess, bring some words of wisdom, and uh, I was really kind of cautious of that. But I do want to thank him for uh, the opportunity. And, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of frustration and there's fear and there's panics. And, uh, you know, we're banks, we're closing our lobbies now due to a virus. Who would have ever, who would have ever thought that something like that would happen? And, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as Jody talked to you guys about, um, as far as options with, with, for cattle producers and things, I just want to assure you as far as the banking side goes that, that banks are strong, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've recovered from the, the 08, 09 housing crisis and, and um, banks are, are strong capitalized and uh, we're here to help. And um, we, we're willing to, willing to work with all the producers. We're, um, you know, we're, we're frustrated like as, as most producers are. Uh, we've, we've went through several, you know, 18 and 19 uh, bad years and just, you know, looking first to February, looking at the, the feeder cattle board, we, you know, it just looked like this was going to be, be the year and then here we are a month into it and and man uh we've got a virus that's you know that, that did this to us so uh, uh we we understand your frustrations and, and we're working daily with our customers to try to bridge this crisis and uh maintain cash flow and and, and uh, as far as our other customers just keeping keeping payroll up that this doesn't because what we're seeing in the banking sector is um people that banking you know as far as market segments we never would have thought had would have been impacted uh you know, are, I mean, who would have thought that, um, you know, beauty uh, shops and hairdressers are having to shut down. I mean, it just, it just, it's so far from where this was 14 days ago. Uh, it's, it, it's, this is definitely a new world. So, but, um, you know, Cody brought you some good options. You know, we're, we're working with customers doing a lot of the many things like that right now that are, that are in the heat of the battle. Uh, a lot of cattle guys, you know, they're, they're not there yet. Um, you know, they won't, they won't really know uh, how bad things are until, you know, we kind of see what happens this summer and, and fall with, with prices and markets. Um, but what I would just encourage you as, as cattle producers is, is start the discussion right now. Uh, don't, don't wait till uh, it's, it's too late or, you know, we're, um, you know, cattle are already in the, in the corral and we don't know what, what our payments are. So I would just encourage you to, um, uh, you know, look over your, look over your balance sheet, your financial statement, uh, and, and start discussions with your lenders and, um, you know, and then, and, and have you a plan together and just, but just don't wait till it's too late. And, um, and, um, and we can always and do our best to help work this through. But, um, but like I said, banks, you know, they're, we're, we're strong, uh, you know, as far as, you know, your money, it's, it's definitely safe. Uh, you know, the FDIC is, uh, has, has, has assured us, um, uh, you know, and, and no one has lost any money on the FDIC since 1933. So, uh, rest assured that. And, and I just would say, man, you know, cash is important. Uh, and as you, you know, as you, people are always frustrated with banks. Well, you know, we've got to have, we've got to maintain equity. We've got to have an equity in this type of purchase. And these are the times where that equity uh, is, is very important and where we're going to see, uh, those guys that have that, um, they're the ones who are going to survive this. So, but like I said, if anybody has any questions, I would love to visit with anyone. Um, you can reach me on my cell phone at 903-908-5913. Uh, I can take calls or text. Um, and also, uh, uh, you can reach us at diamond.bank. Real, real simple. Thanks, Tyler. I want to 
Thank you, sir. I am uh, <clears throat> John Jennings. I'm the Extension Forward Specialist for the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture and the Department of Animal Science. I'm going to talk some about some forage management options for spring and some things that you might be able to do or consider to help get through some of this, uh, especially if you're holding extra cattle. Uh, some of the spring options, I'm just going to make a short list here. Uh, some early pasture rotation sure can make a big difference. I'm going to talk some about targeting and fertilization of existing forages that we have. Weed control for that early Bermuda grass release because we know we got a lot of issues with that in a lot of fields. Uh, seeding and repairing some hay feeding areas. What can we plant? Where can we do it? And then plant annual forages for spring and summer. So this is what the calendar might look like for a lot of our forages that uh, we could recommend. Uh, we have our fescue and orchard grass cool season grasses in the springtime that might carry us up until late June, possibly annual rye grass might carry us into May and then small grains, clovers. And then our Bermuda grass uh, will pick up in May sometime and then carry us on through the summer. And we have some other options there. But one thing to keep in mind, anything you do with your forage practice, you're going to be looking at about 30 days to see the maximum benefit of that. So you ahead to make sure that these things hit your grazing window, depending on when you need that forage and how long you're going to need it. So just to give you an idea of what pasture rotation can do, I've got a set of uh, time-lapse pictures here that Dr. Ray Smith in Kentucky provided to me. And this is a these are two orchard grass plants sitting side by side. One of them was clipped to one inch once a week. One was clipped to three and a half inches once a month. And then this is day one after that was clipping was done. This is day three. And then this is day six. And you can see, you know, that plant on the left that was clipped to one inch once a week, it barely had any regrowth at all. So that's what happens when we put cattle out on pastures when they're first starting to green up, when we let them just continually pick at these fields. They just keep all the green off and you never can accumulate any forage. So pasture rotation does allow forage accumulation ahead of you. And our research indicates that you need about 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds of forage dry matter to support a 400 pound calf if you're grazing stockers. Uh, you also need to have about 1,200 pounds of forage dry matter per acre just to support decent grazing. And so that would generally be in that six to eight inch uh, height category. And then, but if we get on that as soon as we start seeing green rows, coming up from our annuals or fescue greening up. Uh, it'll be that way all through April until the grass finally can get out of the cattle. So we need to start some rotation. So what does it look like when, it, when we're at that turnout stage? These are some pictures that Paul Beck shared from some research that he had done a few years ago. The top photo is about 1,100 pounds of forage dry matter to the acre. And that type of forage could support uh, a 400 pound calf at about an acre and a half for that calf to support them. Now the lower photo is about 1500 pounds of dry matter to the acre. That's ideal for turnout uh, for a calf to the acre and you can expect about two pounds of gain per day on calves at that rate. So just to give you a visual there of what that might look like. Now, don't make the rotation of grazing difficult or complicated. All, if you've got several pastures, all you have to do is close gates and then just start rotating among those fields. Uh, a lot of people like to rotate twice a week, even once a week is much better than no rotation at all and get, get some of that forage accumulation started. If you've got an electric fence, it'd be like this photograph here, just string a, a poly, electrified poly wire across that field and get started. It's just that simple. So don't make it difficult, but it does make a big difference, especially on these big pastures. Now, talk some about <clears throat> targeted fertilization. Early fertilization does make a big difference, and I know we're already past it, uh, the point of this picture, but I wanna show you some of what it can do. Uh, these are a couple of fields that were fertilized, of, of fields of ryegrass that were fertilized on February 15th, uh, one year. And you can see the pictures were taken on March the 23rd on both farms. And both farms have already grazed through these fields once. And so there can be a tremendous amount of forage accumulated there. In the lower left-hand corner, you see a poly wire reel there and a yellow dotted line. On the right side of that yellow dotted line, that ryegrass is about 10 inches deep. And on the, right, the left side, ryegrass is about three inches deep. And that's where the fertilizer truck missed fertilizing that field. So that's how much difference that early fertilization can make. So here's another picture that was taken this week. This is some cereal rye and ryegrass planted onto a Bermuda grass mixed grass pasture last fall. 
this pasture's already been grazed twice this year. It was fertilized in the middle of February. So it can make a big difference uh, getting some of that done quick. Now, the situation we're in right now, we're, we still have an opportunity to get some targeted fertilization done. <clears throat> Normally on fescue, we'd be looking at uh, February for that early green up, but right now we can still get good uh, stimulation to grow through April on into May. Our winter annuals, uh, March, if we can fertilize some of this now to con for continued growth, especially if we're looking at wheat or rye grass. Our cereal rye is already uh, starting to hit that peak of growth. It's putting out a flag leaf and be putting out a seed head very soon. So we really wouldn't get much uh, benefit of fertilizing cereal rye at this point. It's about to mature and it's about past us. Uh, warm season grasses like our Bermuda grass, we want to wait until those nighttime temperatures are about 60 degrees for at least a week. And that normally happens about the first week of May. And it depends on where you are in Arkansas and, and uh, how this spring is continued. It's over 80 degrees today, so we may hit that period early. But if we get some 40 degree nights, it'll shut it down. So that's why we need to wait till we get that sustained warm night temperature. If we have fescue and clover, uh, phosphorus and potash is all we need on those fields. Don't put any nitrogen on those. If we have 25 to 35% clover or so, uh, that uh, should be enough to support good forage growth by itself. Uh, save your nitrogen, put it on your grass fields, your ryegrass, your straight fescue, and other things. And if you're going to do any interseeding of annuals, you want to fertilize those at planting because those have a short growth window when you need to make sure you have enough fertility to support those right off the bat. Okay. We have a lot of fields though <clears throat> that are starting, will be looking like this. Now I took this picture a few years ago that was on April the 26th. That's a month from today. And so we could be looking at some solid yellow fields this year of these uh, Bermuda grass fields filled up with uh, buttercup. Buttercup is uh, really prolific in a wet year and this has been a wet year. So we've got a lot of it out there. Uh, normally we would uh, spray those fields uh, in February with some glyphosate and that would knock that out with along with some other winter annual weeds. But if you look at the picture in the lower left-hand corner, that's Bermuda grass. That picture was taken last week and we've already got Bermuda grass green tips showing up. So uh, the glyphosate option is about off the table for this year, but there's 2,4-D and some other things depending on where you are in the state that we might be able to use. So get with your county agent to look at the best option for your situation. Uh, Fertilizer and chemicals, we've been getting questions about that. Uh, <clears throat> I had some county agents help me and I've talked to some other dealers about what they're seeing. The fertilizer supply looks good currently. Most of what's gonna be used this year is already either in the Gulf or being barged up the river uh, or transported. Uh, so I think the supply is there right now. Uh, looking at the prices, they generally are down from what they have been. Urea is about three fifty-seven dollars a ton. That price is out to about $0.39 cents per pound of nitrogen. Uh, ammonium nitrate is about three sixty-five. dollars That's about $0.54, cents, so it's more expensive. But some areas, that's what the dealers carry. The DAP or diammonium phosphate is about $400 a ton. That's the lowest price on it in several years. And that makes the price of the phosphate in that about $0.28 cents a pound when you subtract the nitrogen value out of that product. Potash is about 340, so that's about 28 cents a pound. And again, that's that's fairly inex fairly cheap compared to previous years. Uh, herbicides, I talked to one large uh, company rep and he said most of their product is made in the US so they don't anticipate any supply bump or uh, hiccup or anything like that. So the product should be available. Uh, <clears throat> next point, well, a lot of us have these hay feeding areas where we've had that long hay feeding season and we get these areas around the hay feeders all tromped up. What do we do with those to keep them from growing up in pigweed or something like that? And we've, we've done a lot of demonstrations on this when we planted, gone in and smoothed those up about this time of year when you plant crabgrass, uh, Bermuda grass, clover, ryegrass, any of those forages, and those tend to fill in just like that lower picture in the right hand corner. That's all clover that was planted in a hay feeding spot. And so that can help get some good quality forages started in some of these fields where we have some of these mudded up areas. Now, the way you plant can make a difference too. Uh, we can overseed and, and pull a drag. You can no-till. If you've got enough forage residue, you can burn that off physically, uh, or you can do some tillage and, and work that field up to plant. But the main thing, if you're gonna plant a permanent forage, uh, this spring, you need to make sure you get rid of what's already there. 
You can't kill fescue or Bermuda grass just by tilling that field up. You need to look at a longer term process than that. Use some herbicides and tillage uh, and look at a long term. So if you try to plant a new hybrid Bermuda grass in a field that's got common Bermuda already, you're looking at about a year process. Doesn't mean you can't grow forage in the meantime, but you can't immediately plant that Bermuda grass. Same way with fescue. So you got to look at what situation you're dealing with to make sure you can uh, achieve success in what you want to do. And that sod suppression is very important. This is a demonstration that we had. This is actually for summer annuals planted for fall. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, picture on the right is where that field was sprayed with some glyphosate to suppress that Bermuda grass sod. And uh, you can see where the corn is up on the one side of it and there's no corn on the other. That's the, just the difference in that herbicide suppression made where it was sprayed on one side and not sprayed on the other. So it does make a huge difference. And even this time of the year, if we're gonna drill into some of these Bermuda grass fields, there's enough weeds and other things that Bermuda grass coming on. If you don't do something to suppress that and you try to drill a winter annual into it, all that will, that's already there will overtake your new planting and you'll be uh, having a successful sand. And keep in mind seed size, if we're planting some of these small seeds like crabgrass and clover, don't plant it too deep. We see more planting failures from planting too deep than probably any other single factor. Now, a lot of us are dealing with situations like this where you have these hay feeding areas that's just turned into complete mud and over the whole field. Now, you can take these, and this is where we get into looking at more of a, a big operation. If you have a drag, harrow, or something like that, you can smooth it back up and you see the tire drag down there in the lower left corner. Uh, something like that works well. There's other implements that'll do it too. If we can smooth that up, then we have the option to plant some different forages. So we get questions all the time starting in February, usually of what they can, what producers can plant for grain grazing or hay crop. And uh, usually we'd think some type of winter annual, but there's a lot of differences in growth patterns and, and yields uh, across these forages. So you have to pay attention. What date are you trying to plant? And at this time, we're looking at that window is really closing pretty quickly. So we're looking at here the last part of March to about the first week of April, we need to get this option done if we're gonna plant some of these winter annuals. I'll show you some research results of what we've done looking at this uh, fall versus uh, spring planting. Uh, these pictures are several different forages that we planted. Uh, <clears throat> this is in 2016 in the fall, we had coke or winter oat, we had winter hawk ryegrass, we had jerry spring oat, we had elbon rye, we had a variety of wheat, we had winford grape, and we had dixie crimson clover. These uh, plots were all harvested on April 19th. This was at Fayetteville. You can see it had very good growth on all these. Some of these were actually, like the rye and the wheat, were actually more mature than, than ideal. They could have been cut a week or two before that. The jerry spring oat nearly all winter killed, but it's a spring oat, so we expected that. Now, here's the same counterparts of those four we just planted on March the 9th, the following spring. The coker winter oat just starting to head out, the jerry winter oat just starting to head out, and so was the annual ryegrass. Very good growth on all those, but that harvest date was May 25th, five weeks later than that fall planted counterpart of those same forages. Now you see the elbow and rye looked a little scraggly. The wheat didn't have any seed heads and it went for rape just about six, eight inches tall and the Dixie Crimson Clover was just a, a stand, but really no growth. So when we looked at that on these small grains, like the wheat and the rye, they have what's called a vernalization requirement. And if that cold period, uh, short uh, day stimulus is not met, that plant won't produce a seed head. And that's what happened on these particular plots on our wheat and our rye we didn't get good vernalization. And so when we look at the yields, that's where it really showed up. On the green bars are the plots that were planted in October, harvested on April 19th. And you can see the elbow and rye was up here about 8,500 pounds, the wheat was about 8,000. Again, those were more mature than, than uh, desirable. Coker winter oat was uh, almost 6,000 pounds, rye grass was almost 5,000, and the clover was in that 46, 4,700 pound range and the rape was even over 3,000 pounds. The Jerry winter oak winter kill. The red bars are what we planted in the spring and harvested on May 25th. You can see the rye and the wheat had very low yields compared to the fall planted plots. The coker winter oak was not much different than the fall planted. The ryegrass was not much different than the fall planted. So those look like good options. The Dixie crimson clover and the rape both had very low yield. 
and the Jerry winter oak was right up at about 5,000 pounds, but as a spring oak did excellent for spring. And so what this research has shown us is that if you're gonna plant in the spring, if we can get it done early enough, the elbow rye or wheat might be a good option. But if you get into March, you're looking at winter oak, spring oak, or rye grass are more uh, solid, more uh, less risky uh, forages to try. Now, here's a demonstration that was planted that same year down in Polk County near Mena, where they planted Jerry Oaks, Elbon Rye, uh, a variety of not state of wheat, and then Gulf Rye grass. These were planted on March 23rd, so about this time. And uh, they planted a six acre uh, demonstration field. And this is uh, just a <clears throat> photographic calendar to show you what happened. On April 7th, you can see the plots were just starting to come up. Hey, uh, by April 14th, you could see rows. April 21st, a little bit more. May 8th, good enough for that grazing could have started there easily enough. And then May 15th, you can see all of them were really up in that good production stage. And these pots were harvested on May the 18th. Now, the Jerry Spring Oak yielded 8,500 pounds of dry matter to the acre, which is excellent, excellent forage yield. The rye and the wheat were both, both less, about three and 4,000 pounds, and the Gulf rye grass about 5,700 pounds. So again, that rye grass and the oats seem to be really solid options. In this case, they got better growth on their rye and wheat than we did there. Now, coming up here, if this carries on very long, and you're looking at for summer options, there are several summer, summer annuals that you can consider. Uh, brown top millet, pearl millet, sorghum sedan are all good options. Plant those about 25 pounds of seed to the acre. Corn, there's some grazing corns out there and some open pollinated varieties that are uh, much less expensive than the hybrids, uh, corns that we typically plant for grain. They generally will run price-wise about a dollar a pound. Uh, plant those about 50 pounds to the acre, about 40 to 50. Crabgrass uh, could be a good option. Plant that at four to six pounds. And all these we'd be looking at planting mid-May to mid-June. And uh, you could look at grazing 30 to 40 days later. And that 30 day one is most likely gonna be that brown top millet. It's got a very short uh, growth cycle. And so you can plant it. And about 30 days later, you could have some good grazable forage. The others on this list are gonna be more in that 40 day range or so to hit a grazing uh, uh, window. So, and if it carries on very long, uh, we've actually done research where we planted these summer annuals like corn, sorghum, sedan, and millet at the end of August. And this picture was taken on October the 11th uh, in 2018. We planted these plots on August 30th as 42 days later when we harvested. And you can see how large that forage was. Now, this could be a discussion for a whole nother uh, presentation. And I hope we don't have to worry about that this year. But I'm sure uh, if this drags on very long, we'll put together another presentation and talk to you about it then. And so here's kind of our calendar again. We'll throw that back up. All these spring options like our fertilizing our existing fescue, fertilizing ryegrass and small grazers are already, already out there. We might be able to plant some of these winter annuals right now, uh, and, but those won't give us forage until mid to late May. Uh, summer annuals, if we've got those established already, especially Bermuda grass, we're going, we need to get the weeds off of those so they can green up early and uh, then look at these others. But all these have a setup or a preparation and planning time ahead of them. You can't just go out and expect to have Bermuda grass tomorrow. Uh, we've got to set up and prep time to make sure that works. So just kind of review a th few things. Start rotating those pastures right now, and that will get uh, that forage accumulating ahead of it. Fertilize the cool season grasses and winter annuals as soon as possible. Get some weed control on that Bermuda grass to release it and get it growing, especially with these warmer early temperatures. Overseeding those hay feeding areas can get something growing back on those. Plant oats and rye grass, and those two can go together. Fertilize that Bermuda grass in early May. And then if we need summer forage, we can plant those in May and June. So always plant at least one season ahead and remember that 30 day rule because. Uh, it takes a little bit of time for these forages to catch up after you've done something. 